So um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Noam Weiss. I'm an architect at Checkpoint. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some practical experience that we had for the last couple of years uh, doing runtime uh, reflection in C++ in our production code. Um, a, a few caveats. Uh, the lecture is based on the code that we do run in production. I'm not going to show you the actual production code for a very simple reason. Uh, it's a very large code base. Uh, and I didn't think we had time to cover it all. So I've simplified as much as I can. I simplified both the requirements and what we did. I wanted to focus just on the reflection part of the code. Um, and I really had to make some, for me, painful cuts, including removing dealing with costness, which is something that like I was <laughs> when I had to do that. Uh, so uh, the, the point of, of this is uh, please don't copy paste anything from here directly to your code. Please uh, use your better judgment and, and, and fix uh, the issues that are undoubtedly in this, uh, in this example. Uh, okay. Uh, let's talk about reflection. Um, our working definition of reflection is the ability of the code to answer questions about itself. And when we ask, does uh, C++ has uh, reflection in it? Um, the answer is some. We do have things like size of, uh, type ID, runtime type identifications that do offer some capabilities of uh, what you can describe as reflection. Uh, in fact, some of the definitions uh, of reflections are people specifically trying to exclude the, the, the reflective uh, properties of C++. So, so uh, they can say that C++ has no uh, reflection capabilities. Uh, let, let's agree to say that uh, whatever uh, C++ reflection does have, uh, it, it doesn't have the resolution that uh, uh, other languages currently have. Uh, reflection is yeah. really cool. Uh, and it's uh, mostly not practical. If uh, I went and searched uh, in forums and stack overflows in languages that do have strong uh, uh, reflection capabilities, uh, Java, C Sharps, other, and whenever somebody posts a question of, of why should I, when or when should I uh, uh, use a reflection? The answer is mostly don't. Uh, it's, not, it's not a good idea. Um, and there's a lot of confusion when people uh, give examples of reflection of things that are not actual reflections. Um, and the main reason why people say, uh, 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 don't use it is because it's very expensive among other things. And when people who uh, we, who use higher level uh, languages who don't really uh, uh, usually are so concerned as most of uh, us are uh, about the performance say this is expensive, you know, it's expensive. Um, Still, I, I found a case when uh, it was actually made sense for me to, to, use, to use reflection. So let's uh, talk about that. And the case is uh, we wanted to handle REST calls. Uh, and REST calls, are, if, we don't, if you don't know, it's basically sending a JSON over HTTP. Uh, there's a few more other things about it, but that's the basic idea. And what do we want? We want to send such a REST call, so write to socket, we want to receive one, to read from it. And, and this is the uh, problematic part for us. Uh, we want to be able to generate a schema, basically to self-describe the, uh, the REST call that we do. This is a way that um, many services can keep track about uh, of what's going on in the system. And, Okay, so uh, basically you, you can imagine the sort of classic uh, object-oriented solution. We'll have some base class that does all the read, write, and schema, and we can inherit from that and implement all of our uh, different REST calls. The pretty standard uh, solution. And there is a problem with that. Um, and that is a lot of uh, 
boilerplate code that we need to, to do in this implementation. For every variable that we want to add, remove, rename, we need to change all the three uh, functions that I just mentioned. So if I want to add another uh, variable in the call, I need to change the rate, the write, and the schema. And it generates a lot of maintenance works. And basically nobody ever changes the schema. And the reasons that nobody changes the schema is it will work if you don't change the schema 99% of the time. Only when you get to production and somebody tries to uh, use another system that looks at your system and try to understand what it does, will you encounter a problem. But if you are sending and, and uh, receiving your own messages, you already know what the, what the structure of the, of the message is. So there is no problem. Only when somebody external to you tries to ask, well, what is the structure that you support? You get into a problem. And the, the, the issue is uh, it can get by code review quite easily because when you review a code change, you review the change that was done, not the change that wasn't done. So yeah, uh, the code review tool will probably highlight you've changed here, these two functions. Nobody knows that you also should have changed the third function. And since it works, uh, there is the obvious solution of, yeah, I, I know there's a problem, but I'll fix it later. And later doesn't come until something in production crashes. Um, and of course, in, in some sense, it's a duplicated logic. I have all those variables that I have, and I do the same thing of all of them three times in the code. Um, basically, what, what we would like is to have some way to get, these are my members, and I want to iterate them and either read, write, or output the schema for each and every one of them. Um, so uh, let's start doing just that. Um, so this is the example of the read. So I assume that I'm going to read for a moment from a std i stream. And this is what I want. So basically the, the first problem that I need to, to address is how to, is to have some way to iterate over my members. So we are going to have some sort of vector, which is the read members. And we are going to iterate over that vector and do the magic that we do. And of course, once we have the vector, we also need uh, some sort of way to add the new uh, elements to that vector. Okay. So what do we do with read member? Okay, uh, one solution is to have a, a function that simply receives the read and does whatever we want to, to read with it. Okay, so we have now a, a vector of functions. You can see how this is going to be a very large element. Uh, and the read function really iterates over that read uh, uh, member and calls each function to read the relevant member. So the base class would look something like this. Uh, we have read, write, and schema, which are the three uh, functions that we want to uh, use reflection in. They both, each and every one of them iterates over the relevant vector. Um, we have the add that allows us to add uh, new elements to our reflection database. And we have the three vectors that we use. Okay, so Let's see what, that, what this makes us. It means that now that we have a derived class, uh, we can just say add read age, write age, schema age, read name, write name, schema name. And uh, we can have those members uh, internally. So this is a lot shorter than what we would have had to do beforehand when we had to implement three uh, three methods uh, and repeat the uh, age and name in each and every one of them. That's a little bit better, but not good enough. And the first thing that is not good enough for me, and maybe this will seem a little strange. The first problem that I have is that I have to uh, deal with two places. 
one where I uh, defined the variable and once in the constructor when I add things. So I can just write a class that will do the adding for me. So I have a structure here called auto adder because it automatically adds uh, all the uh, elements uh, that I want. It receives a pointer to the best rest, uh, the relevant members and adds them internally, which means uh, now I don't need the constructor anymore. The default constructor will actually uh, create what I want. So all the information is now in one place, which is great because when it's uh, uh, grouped together like this, I can, I can uh, change into a macro and really have one line at the end of the day. And the one line and the macro does basically what we've seen before, defines the uh, member and use auto adder to uh, uh, generate uh, the code in the constructor that will automatically add all the relevant functions that I need in order to uh, access that member using reflection. And you can imagine from looking at the code that I'm going to have uh, other macros that will generate those functions. And that's pretty simple. Once you know, once you can think about it, uh, I can capture the relevant uh, member by reference. We will talk about that more in a moment. Have uh, whatever a definition of uh, uh, that we want and internally do the thing that we want you to do. This is the thing that I'm going to start to vaguely, uh, please don't uh, look at the man behind the curtain sort of thing, because that's not super relevant for the reflection itself. But basically we, we have now erased the type. Instead of uh, knowing what the actual type of uh, name is, we now have a function that, accept, that gets uh, a I stream reference and does, the ref does whatever we want the reflection to do. Okay, so right now we have uh, a base class and a helper class, one that does uh, the iteration for the reflection and one that does the uh, adding uh, stuff to the reflection. We have a set of macros that defines the, uh, the functions that uh, are going to, to do the actual reflections. And we have one macro that wraps it all up in something that is uh, easier for a developer to actually use. So the derived class looks like this. And if I have to write another, uh, uh, another, uh, another derived class, it will be uh, just as easy. It's uh, it's very, uh, very simple. And if I change anything, it changes all of the uh, read, write and schema elements together. Uh, and nobody needs to remember or think up too much about, uh, about all this stuff. Um, so this works. Uh, we'll get to, uh, to, to see an actual example in a moment. But um, since we've captured the members by reference, uh, the functions are tied to specific memory locations. Meaning that if we will try to uh, copy or move the object, we can run into a problem. Um, and in order to, read, uh, to fix that, we're going to have to rewrite the uh, Lambda expressions a little bit. So they will not depend in absolute memory locations. They can only depend on relative uh, memory location and calculate the exact uh, memory address based on that. How do we do that? Well, uh, we know we're inheriting from base. So we can use base uh, to, get the rel the, to get the relative uh, address, use static cast to get the actual type that we know we are working with. And then and when we have the actual pointer to the actual members class, we can access it and do whatever we want in the, uh, in the macro. Caveat, that's not a problem that I, I have encountered, but uh, multiple inheritance, the diamond shape element will be an issue. 
So uh, I don't know why you will need multiple inheritance uh, uh, and accessing the, uh, the element like that, but be aware of that uh, limitation. Um, but that's the... Uh, uh that's the the, the main uh, 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 that's the main uh, shape of things uh so let's go and see an actual code example i think that would be uh a good idea all right let me just share oh, i think this is the thing i want to share can i can i ask a question meanwhile or sure like a very short one Okay, so we have some, we have few things that we're dealing with, um, partially by reflection, partially by code generation, sort of tries to deal with similar issues. Uh, I was just wondering if you were, did you had like cases where you consider taking this out of the C++ code base and doing things external to the code base or? No, instead of macros, somehow to generate this, or maybe it's not the use case that you need, but I'm just wondering if it came up. Uh, no, partly because uh, I believe that there's enough facilities in the language itself to allow me to do whatever I need. Um, uh, partly because requiring two, two, two phase uh, sort of building yeah. has its own issues that I didn't want to deal with. Yeah, um, I, I was actually, I mean, to, like you're right, there's issues and also some benefits in a way, but yeah, I, I, I mean, clearly it's a more complex solution, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, I've uh, I've uh, made a, uh, an example here that we can look at. Uh, basically, the base race is uh, I've decided to um, for this example only pass the uh, base race pointer uh, and have the lambda expressions internally know that they are going to send uh, to a std out or read from uh, some sort of uh, global element uh, for simplicity's sake. Uh, uh, but as you can see, uh, it's just like we discussed, the do write, do read, and uh, do schema uh, are um, basically a loop over those vectors that contains the reflection uh, uh, functions. I can add functions to uh, to my uh, reflection database, we can call it. Um, again, here I, I, I add all three of them at the same once. In the actual solution, there is more granularity than that. Um, I have my auto adder, which adds uh, elements all by itself. And I have the same macros as we did before where uh, write, read, and schema in my cases know exactly how to work with either std out or the specific global string stream just so I can easily write something in and something out. So what do I do? I have uh, uh, my uh, derived rest. I first of all uh, uh, output the schema. Uh, then I put some values that uh, I can read. So when I read and write them, I can see that I will actually get uh, that my age is 40 and my name is Norm, which is what we get here at the output. So this works, this is fine. Uh, we can uh, explore a little bit better and look at exactly what's going on here. There's a lot. Uh, I specifically uh, tried to, uh, decided to ask for a, O0 uh, um, optimization. So we'll see everything uh, spelled out as uh, nicely as we could. Um, but, this, uh, but this works and 
one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to show is and I should probably spell this correctly. Um, 120 bytes, basically for an integer and a string. And if I'm going to just have an integer, that's 80. That's a lot for an integer, basically. Had I just used, uh, uh, forgot the, uh, uh, the, the reflection, I could have write, written this down with just the integer itself. So quite a lot of overhead in memory. And that's before we've calculated the fact that I used the vector. So there is also some dynamically allocated memory in there somewhere as well. So it's a size, it's a size. If you are stretched for memory or if this is something that, uh, 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 that is important, uh, please take that into consideration. There's also a lot of code here that was generated with all of these calls and all of these loops that happens basically so I can print age and 40. So there are things we can do to make this better. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, uh, reflection is expensive. There's no two ways about it. Uh, you have to have some sort of database which holds exactly what you're looking at. Uh, I know there's a paper that uh, in Bach showed in the past, which uh, talks about metaprogramming and reflections with metaprogramming. And it tries to solve the problem basically by saying, okay, the compiler already contains that information. So if we do a compile time reflection, we sort of can get that for free or at a, or, the, or, the, or the very low cost in any case. But if you're doing one time uh, reflection, you have to pay the cost and it's significant. Um, but where, what, where is the, does the cost lie? Uh, some of it lies in the vectors and all of that, but there's another place that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that lies, uh, that hides some cost. Uh, so I want to uh, look at a uh, size of basic rest. Doesn't like me. Uh, uh, that will work. Base, base, base. Without the IC? Not base, base. Oh, I'm an idiot. Live coding is always hard. Yeah. Base rest, size off. Why does it like me? Okay, excellent. Uh, okay, so uh, base rest is 72 bytes. The derived class is uh, 80 bytes. So the eight bytes of difference for an integer that should take about four bytes. So where are, so anybody can guess where the other four bytes come from? Alignment. Good guess, no. Oh, partially true, but why alignment of what to what? V table. No, there's no V table here. That's one of the problems in this code, by the way. There is no V table here. Nothing is virtual at all. What's the, uh, how many members do I have here exactly? Oh, it's the, the, the auto adder. It's the auto adder. It doesn't have any members, but it still takes one byte of memory because every structure has to take at least one byte of memory. And then you align it, so you get the other four bytes. But there's this empty base 
uh, hundreds of uh, the, the, there's an uh, attribute for no uh, address. No unique address in no C++ one. So that, that, that's one way to, to solve this. There are others. You could write a template that will wrap your element, in which case you will have to access the data member through the template, but uh, you will save the memory. So plus and minuses, but you can do that. There's also a bunch of uh, heap allocators. Because the type erasure in stood function happens three times per member. So this and that beside the vector itself. You got a whole bunch of uh, heap allocated stuff here. Yeah. Yes, yes, there, there, there's a lot. Uh, uh, if we can start to, to count it, uh, it will grow. It will grow. It definitely won't be just the this few bytes that I'm showing you here right now. So be careful uh, with it. This is why uh, whenever you look, somebody says, please uh, be, be careful. And if you think, if you're not sure if you should, if you should or shouldn't use a, a reflection, the answer is probably you shouldn't. Um, but uh, so that's nice. Uh, um, th that works, that's what we do in production, uh, but as I was preparing this talk, I was thinking to myself, th th this is fine. This does what I wanted to do, but it's not actually that generic reflection. I mean, I, I did kind of sort of tailored it specifically to my use case. Could I do a generic reflection in, in C++? What would that entail? So that was a fun hour and I can show you the results. Uh, so uh, basically we're doing the same things, but we added a few, uh, a few uh, options. Um, we now have uh, a pure reflect, which uh, really allows us to get for every member uh, its name, uh, its type and its address. And the thing that I chose to, uh, to do here is basically have a template function, which I provide a type and a name, and I return, return the type by reference. So I iterate over all the various reflections. I check if I find something that matches the name and the type. And if so, I cast it and return it. If I didn't find, if somebody asked me uh, for a member that doesn't have, or asked me for a member that does exist, but gave me the wrong type, uh, I throw an exception. It's a runtime exception, similar to what you would get if you did, I don't know, dynamic cast or something. And uh, so I run the same code here. I try to get uh, the age and uh, get me older by one year. And as you can see, it actually works. So I can get access to the member with uh, uh, directly, and it's a generic. And once I have this, you could easily take that and uh, write your own uh, extensions, like give me all the names of all the members, give me uh, 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 um, all the members that are integers, give me everything and so on and so forth. So this is quite generic. Um, can anybody see the problem? Why reflection is a problem? What did I do here that, you know, if you're an object-oriented person, you should cry, no, this is wrong. A broke encapsulation. Exactly, a broken encapsulation. Age here is private. I should not have access to it. But through reflection, I do. And this is actually one of the reasons uh, people use reflections in things like unit testing. And in my uh, opinion, this is a bad use of reflection. Breaking encapsulation, it, it's a recipe for disaster. Would you be interested in taking questions? There's a question in the chat, uh, I think. It's sure, I love to. Yeah. 
So, so Shahaf is asking why not use the code generator for something like this, maybe protobuf, similar to the question I asked, but if you want to answer specifically about protobuf for. Um, I, honestly, I didn't consider it too much. Um, again, I, I'm a little reluctant about the two phase issue. I, I very much like the, the fact that this is the code it compiles and, and it runs and uh, it allows me to do the changes and, and, and do things uh, quite easily. I've seen several system which did use code generation in, in some sense. Uh, to my eternal shame and uh, I also wrote one. Uh, sometimes it works great, sometimes not so much. Uh, since this is a system that's supposed to serve several dozens uh, of developers, uh, keep it simple. What uh, was the idea, uh, basically? Um, and so if there are any more questions, uh, please do send them my way. And I just wanted to show uh, just one last thing. If I try to access edge and say it's a string, uh, then of course I get a runtime error. So again, be careful because we are still using strongly typed language and you can get into troubles. Okay, uh, any more questions, uh, comments? Have you, have you tried uh, Louis Dion's library? I forgot its name. I'm sure it's something to remember. Uh, where he has, he can generate like a, a, a tuple of types and, and a lot of the stuff um, is relatively easier to do. Uh, so you can kind of do it as a tuple. Um, it's not really a tuple, it's kind of a, um, I, know, I, I would like to see this compared to some, you know, uh, to his work or Boost has something very similar where you just declare a macro. And I think there is this really cool library called Magic Get, which uses uh, portable hacks, um, which are standard compliant to iterate over most normal stuff. I mean, I'm not sure it gets like friend enums and stuff like that, but it does handle um, uh, members and members and members and stuff like that. So, uh, um, yeah, I'd be interested in making such a, such a comparison. I haven't done so, I have to say. It's uh, called Magic Get. You know, maybe someone who remembers it. Yeah, from Anthony Poluki. I'll post the link to the chat. Kind of if I remember correctly, uh, Adi, if I remember correctly, magic get can only uh, uh, work by index. It cannot extract the names of the of the fields. It converts a struct to tuple or and, and things like that. Maybe I now see that it's 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 got me into boost. So boost. But uh, but what what I see uh, I just made a, uh, a query on GitHub and I find there uh, quite a few uh, uh, repos where they do a reflection through LLVM. Uh, uh, intermediate presenta representation. And this makes perfect sense, uh, actually. Uh, well, that's rewriting the code. Uh, Sorry? I don't know. I think for that, you probably need to link to lib. What's it called? Lib. Uh, no, your, no, your, your, code, your code is effective. Your code is affected, yes, but uh, this is a uh, an LLVM plugin that 
uh, allows you to reflect on the uh, names of uh, fields of your struct. Uh, for example, for JSON uh, serialization. I've seen somebody mention uh, magic enums uh, in the in the comments. I've actually looked at that. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a very clever. I really enjoyed uh, going through the code. Um, my one caveat with magic enum, and they, they are very explicit in saying that they are. Uh, it's not based on the standard. It's based on com various compiler implementations. Um, okay, maybe. So, 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 so uh, they, they basically uh, use the uh, elements of the um, name mingling that C++ has to deduce, uh, 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 to deduce a lot of information. Um, um, so uh, so that's how that works. And since I didn't want to depend on that, uh, I went and decided to try and do something that is you know, strictly based on the standard. Uh, you can argue whether or not that's necessary because basically you don't work with the abstract standard, you work with concrete compiler at the end of the day, but uh, still. Um, so, if there are no more questions, uh, I just have like one more slide to share, just a summary of a sort. So uh, what are my conclusions uh, going through all of this? Uh, first of all, reflection is costly. Uh, it costs you a lot of memory, costs you a lot of runtime. Um, the current solution that I've shown has an extra problem that the reflection has to be recreated for every instance. That's probably solvable, I believe. Uh, I didn't actually go and try to solve it, but I believe that, that, that is something that you can solve in one way or the other. Um, I think we've said so before, I think Andre said it. You can get anything you want if you're willing to pay for it. Uh, so I wanted, so I paid for it, uh, it worked. Um, the power of the language uh, rests in the fact that it supports uh, so, many pro uh, so many paradigms. Uh, I've used object-oriented, macro metaprogramming, and generic programming to achieve this. And um, I had confidence that I will be able to achieve this exactly because I knew there are a lot of facilities in the language, some of whom I had to actually learn to achieve this, but still, uh, it worked at the end of the day. And I believe it was totally worth it. Uh, why was it totally worth it? Because as expensive as it is, um, it's not something that happens a lot in our system. Talking an event that happens once in a while. So having to pay a little bit of extra when that happens, not the end of the world for us. It's not part of the main operation of the system. The user change configuration, we get a notification. Okay, great, how much that, how much of that happens? Not like every minute. Um, so had we had to do this on our main, uh, uh, on our main uh, execution flow, wouldn't be a valid uh, option. But for the uh, things that go in a low priority and have to go over the web, uh, it's fine. It's good enough. And while uh, working with REST in C++ is still more painful than painful. I think it should be, it's much less painful than it, than it was before. And people don't forget all the various actions that need to be taken when they change priorities, when they change uh, a member from being mandatory to optional and, and a lot of other things that uh, have you changed anything? No, I haven't changed anything. Yes, you did. Make, changing something from mandatory to optional is a change. Uh, you, need to, you need to address that. Um, so uh, all of those problems that used to plague us disappeared and uh, development became much faster. So, and that's also something that uh, we should need uh, to concern ourselves with. So I'm happy with this uh, at the end of the day. Again, 
this is a demo example. The actual solution, as I said, is more complicated, needs to deal with costness, what happens then. We don't need to allow uh, writing the object to change the object. Currently, it theoretically can. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of issues there. Uh, I said that there, there's a problem that it's not, it doesn't, doesn't have uh, the best class, doesn't have virtual destructure, it should. Lots of things that we should uh, develop uh, in order to get this back to be a uh, production grade code. But I hope that at least you get a, a sense of how this would have worked or how to address this problem if you do want to do something like that. Um, so uh, thank you. And if there are any more questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. <laughs>